Fantastic uh, to get you to Ireland. Finally, for the Pendulum Summit. I know I've been tormenting you for years. Uh, please, please come to Pendulum. And uh, just on behalf of myself, Pendulum, and most people in Ireland, uh, you're so welcome uh, to come to Pendulum Summit next January. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, and, and appreciate your uh, your persistence. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, it finally worked out with my schedule and everything. So yeah, super excited. And um, this this is gonna it's gonna sound crazy, but this is my first time. This will be my first time ever to Ireland. I've never been to Ireland before. <laughs> it's many times that I've been to the UK. As many places I've been around the world, I've never been to Ireland. So really looking forward to it. Wow, that's that's incredible. That was my next question. Actually, have you been to Ireland before? That that's great. And uh, you must obviously yeah. know some. I think Ireland have been quite competitive in uh, athletics over the, over the years. You probably know some of our uh, Irish athletes. We've had. Uh, I don't want to start mentioning some of them now, but uh, Sanya O'Sullivan, of course, and John Tracy, and uh, a lot a lot of the track and field guys like that. Uh, Robert Heffernan, of course, who got a bronze medal. He'd be from Cork, where I'm from. So you'd be familiar with a good few of them, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Some some great, uh, great Ireland, uh, Irish track and field athletics heritage uh, uh, for many years, and 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 now as well. So yeah, I, I definitely am familiar with some of those guys. Great. So I suppose the purpose of this uh, interview, and thanks again for agreeing to do the interview, is I guess to whet the appetite for uh, the pendulum uh, delegates, uh, some people who are already agreed to attend but there's others as well like we need to kind of get to give them a small bit but not too much right because we need them to attend the event so I suppose with that in mind I suppose uh, we've a team this year Michael of uh, fueling peak performance and holistic well-being right and uh, we deal with a lot of companies who are looking at areas like uh, mental resilience uh, elite performance uh, and purpose and passion when I kind of throw those things at you, uh, what 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 comes into your head? Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 the pursuit of excellence. That's you know, all of those things are you know part of the journey to ultimately the reason why these companies are interested in peak performance, interested in you know um, you know cohesive teams, and you know and and culture. All of those things are you know, a prerequisite for achieving excellence. And so whether that's, you know, medals on the track, whether that's, you know, championships, you know, for teams and sport, or whether that is, you know, record years of revenue or sales for companies or scaling, you know, to a specific level, you know, you know, it's very competitive and um, and you need to be at your best in order to, to uh, to achieve those goals and and all of those are prerequisites. So all of those things, you know, um, you know, you know, to me, it's all about. They all relate back to how do you, as an individual or as an organization, how do you achieve peak performance? How do you achieve excellence? Okay, very interesting. And if you if you can, would you take us back to uh, the uh, the young Michael Johnson? where it kind of began first where you know were you always a runner what were you like as a as a kid how did you get into this whole space yeah I, you know as a kid i was you know i was really fortunate to to be involved in sport early um as a kid just playing sport surely for the fun of it you know with no pressure to sort of you know become you know anything just no expectations of becoming an Olympian or being the best or being the fastest. It was just surely out of, you know, the joy of, of playing sport and wanting to be better than the other kids and wanting to win the races, wanting to win the games, wanting to be, you know, wanting to be picked to play on a team, you know, you know, and um, so it was a great experience for me. So, you know, as an example, you know, basketball was big in my community and we played a lot of basketball and I wasn't very good at basketball, very good at, you know, obviously sprinting, very good at American football, pretty good at soccer, not very good at football, as you call it, uh, but not very good at, uh, at basketball. But we always played basketball. We played all kinds of sports. So when we played basketball, you know, 
it wasn't organized sport. It wasn't organized. It was just a bunch of kids in our neighborhood at the park playing. So there were no adults around to make sure that everyone gets their chance and, you know, and that it's fair and equal. It was just, you know, it was all meritocracy. <laughs> it was like, you know, if you got one kid and it's, you know, his turn to be the team captain and choose who he wants on his team, he's going to pick the players that he thinks is going to help them win. And I wasn't chosen because I wasn't very good at basketball. And I wanted to get better. So what did I do? You know, after school every day, I had to pass by that basketball court, you know, by that park and walk through it. And I would, there's the ball there and I pick it up and start practicing my shots, try to get better so that I get, get chosen the next time, you know? So, you know, it started early on sort of understanding that, you know, I have to put in the work, you know, if I want the reward. And it's a very simple thing, but when it's ingrained in you early on, it takes on a completely different perspective in your life and how you approach things. Um, similarly, um, you know, recognizing, you know, who I am as an individual, who I am, what are my strengths and weaknesses, soccer, you know, football, sprinting, I'm very good, you know, basketball, I'm not very good. And I recognized that early on, that was a weakness that I had to work on. So again, it sounds very simple, but when you start to learn those things very early on in life, it takes on a different perspective and a different part of how you then carry on through life and how you start to, you know, govern yourself and work on things to in pursuit of what it is that you want. That kind of ties nicely into where I wanted to go with the next question is the whole, the age old debate, nature versus nurture. You know, is this, you know, was Michael Johnson, would people say this guy was always going to be an Olympic champion? He was just that good. Um, Or did you have a combination that you had talent, but you equally worked unbelievably hard as well, you know, and I suppose for other people out there, and there's my own kids and other kids who might even listen to this interview. Where, where is it? I mean, the nature versus nurture in your view. But it really depends on where you are. You know, if we're talking about kids, then yeah, you know, at that level, it's all about, you know, nurture. It's just, you know, the hardest working kids are going to be the best, but at the elite level, everybody's talented everybody's talented at an absolutely ridiculous level and so you're not going to have in most sports especially those that are you know athletic based sports where the you know there's there's athleticism and then there's skill you know golf is a highly skilled sport you know race car driving highly skilled sport skill doesn't mean that there isn't athleticism in there because athletes are those sports men and women in those sports get offended when someone says they're not athletes. They are athletes, but the skill is probably 90%. Athleticism is 10%. You can debate those ratios versus football, um, you know, soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, athletics. It's probably 90% athleticism, 10% skill. So, and then all of the other sports fall along that spectrum somewhere. Athletic-based sports at the world-class level, everyone is extraordinarily talented. So you can't work your way into elite sport. It doesn't work that way. Everybody's working hard. Everyone's talented. Um, so you have to find those sort of little tiny marginal gains, and you have to be focused on the small things, all of the tiny things. You have to be really, really good at the fundamentals as well. And ultimately, you have to figure out how do I get the best out of myself, which is not by doing what everyone else is doing, but by understanding for me specifically, what do I need to do to get the best performance out of myself? And that's going to be the difference maker. Hard work is not a difference maker at that point, at that level. So, um, you know, for, for me growing up and, and as a kid involved in sport, then it was all about hard work. But ultimately, yeah, it had to, you know, that was that became the price of admission into professional sports, hard work and talent, you know, are absolutely required. And that's when I learned to start looking for those tiny, small, marginal things that, you know, can make the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal, especially when you're talking about winning or losing races in hundreds and thousands of a second. Um, and, um, and, and it's the same way in, in business. Everyone's working really hard. You know, everyone wants the same things. They want to be their best. They want to be the best in their industry. And it's all about, you know, how well can you master the fundamentals, but also, you know, what are the specific things to you 
uh, uniquely as an individual or as an organization that you can use in order to um, to get an edge. It's interesting because um, your running style was, I, I won't try and do it here, but it was quite, you know. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> It was quite, it was quite upright, and I'm I'm just curious because it's interesting when you say I suppose people say be yourself with more skill and and be you know be yourself more. Were there times where their coaches told you before you you can't do it that way? You need to change your style, and you know I suppose that a lot of people could probably uh, reflect and kind of draw comparisons to that themselves over the over the years. Yeah, there's, there's a really good lesson there um, because yeah, I was told by. When I was moving from high school to the um, to the next level here in America, which is our great collegiate university system, uh, that where, where most of uh, the athletes here develop, um, all of the coaches that were recruiting me were saying to me that I would need to change my style if I was going to be uh, world class. Which I, I was absolutely willing to do it. Um, I was aware that my style was unique, and I was ready to change it if that's what I needed to do to get to the level, next level, because I would do whatever. Um, but the university I chose and the coach there um, never mentioned my style, never tried to change it. And, um, and and I never questioned why he didn't. I just followed along because I was very young at that point. But ultimately, once I became world class, then those sort of things came up again that, hey, you know, Michael Johnson has the the potential to break world record, but he'll have to change the style to do so. And at that point, now I'm an adult. And so then and um, and my coach and I started to answer those questions. And my coach said, look, you know, we don't see anything wrong with his style. It is different, yes, but just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. And um, and he said then, early on, I have a hunch that it actually is what makes him really good. And he wasn't 100% sure about that, but he had a hunch. And, 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 um, and ultimately, we did have some studies done uh, with our sports science lab here and, um, and found that it was actually the thing, one of the things that, uh, that contributed to my, my performance and my efficiency. Um, but it was just that everyone who had come before me, all of the great sprinters that came before me ran in a different way. Um, so, so the lesson there for us was, you know, there are some fundamentals, look, you know, that you can't ignore for anything that are required to be successful in anything. And sprinting is no different. There are some fundamentals, but, a different running style that's more upright doesn't necessarily run contrary to contrary to the fundamentals. Um, so once you've got the fundamentals out of the way and you can check all of those off, then you know it might make sense for people and individuals uh, and organizations to look at you know what sort of unique advantages might we have over everyone else that we can use to be better because that's exactly what happened with me. Very interesting. One of the questions I have, and I know this comes through, and I'm putting myself in the shoes of uh, a typical delegate that goes to Pendulum Summit every year. These guys could be leading a team of 10, 20, 30. And uh, while there's so many comparisons we can draw between kind of business and sport, one of the things I think that sometimes people can struggle with is uh, clearly for you, uh, you've had to have a, such a single-mindedness determination to do what you have done uh, and and even other sports people who haven't done it to your level they need to be quite at times quite selfish i think and they need to get everything right abc and get everything like clockwork when it comes to leading a team uh, how how sometimes can you i suppose communicate that style okay one of the teams this year in pendulum is compassionate leadership because the days of you know there's a huge um I suppose, struggle to get the right people in organizations. Now, there's a labor shortage, especially over here where we are. And you can't anymore just bang the hammer and say, do it. And that's it. This is the way it has to be done. And and it's I think it can be a struggle. And, and people, there's, a, there's blurred lines in between. How do you do that? And getting those lessons from sport uh, into business, because you can't just demand something anymore, you know, especially, you know, in, in, in a high level sports side of things. I, I don't know if I asked that question right, but maybe I, I've given you some idea of what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lot there. And I think that it's a very unique time, you know, in history right now with regard to how people, you know, manage and, and, and with regard to how the workplace, you know, uh, functions, um, how society functions, how we parent, how we, you know, all of those things. And I think that, you know, I think that the evidence, you know, supports that it's been a while now 
you know, where while, you know, it may have been effective to manage in that way where it's sort of, you know, singular focus, pounding, you know, people into submission, you know, uh, simply because they had no other choices and because that was the standard. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily effective on its face. It was effective because people had to conform or otherwise they couldn't pay their bills and they would be out of a job. So they just conformed to it. And so those who conformed best got the, you know, the, the, the promotions and all of those sorts of things. So it seemed like, well, that's how you succeed. And then those people who then got promoted into management positions themselves, you know, did the same thing, you know, that uh, was done to them. And that because they felt like, well, that's how you succeed. But I think it's been, it's been proven that, you know, it, it, it's not really the way, but we're in a unique time now where, you know, um, you know, this new generation, these, you know, Gen Z's and, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going to put up with that. And they're going to change the, the narrative. They've done it. They see that, you know, it's not, it doesn't work. It's not right. And, and it's not, not, uh, so they, they don't accept it. So I think you have to understand, you know, how as a manager of people, how to, get the best out of people. And the best way is to start with understanding, you know, you mentioned compassionate leadership. That, I mean, that doesn't mean what I think a lot of people immediately sort of think and what immediately comes to mind, you know, compassionate leadership means not holding people to account or not, you know, demanding the best from people. That's not what it means. It means helping people, you know, get the best from themselves. I mean, with my own teams and my companies, you know, um, you know, I learned, fortunately, I learned early on that, you know, even though my employees would come to me and say, you know, hey, Michael, you know, you've been very successful. You know, I want to do what you did so I can be successful. And I had to learn that, you know, even though you're coming to me asking me to do, <laughs> you know, what I did and thinking that's going to help you be successful, you're not me. We're very, very different people. You're motivated differently. You're inspired differently. You're wired differently. Your strengths and weaknesses are very different than mine, where I have some weaknesses. My, some of my weaknesses are your strengths. Some of your strengths you know, uh, uh, some of your weaknesses are my strength. So you need to, what, and so what I had to do was to help them do what, you know, I was able to do, which is figure out based on all of those things about myself and how well I understand myself, this is my formula for success. This is how I get the best for myself. So helping them understand those things about themselves so they can formulate their own plan for how they succeed and figure out how to get the best from themselves. That was my job. That is my job as a manager uh, of people. And um, and that's how you lead. You lead people in that way. You lead people by, um, you know, helping them to, to get the best from themselves, but while at the same time, simultaneously, expecting and demanding the best from them as well. Um, and, and, and giving them the resources to be the best and giving them the space to be the best as well. You're not giving them the resources and you're not giving them the space to be the best um, if you're telling them, you know, everything that they need to do and you're not giving them the ability to make mistakes and you're not giving them the ability to, you know, to 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 to, to execute in the way that they, they see you as, as, as best. But you're also not giving them the, the ability to be their best if you're not holding them to account and you're letting them just sort of get away with being less than them would have expected as well. So it's a balance. Very good. And um, I've only a couple more questions, really. I mean, this has been fantastic. But I, again, we want to save it for the Pendulum Summit on the day. Um, a, a question, I suppose, I have myself and uh, is with my own kids. Uh, and the new the new generation, I suppose we're talking about the new guys into into the workforce now, but the, the younger ones again, I've a I've a 15, a 14 year old, I have a 12 year old, and I've twins eight, and they spend more time on phones and, and machines and all these PlayStations. And uh, I mean it, it's kind of worrying. I mean, sometimes you feel you're sleepwalking into it. And I mean, they're they're, they're talented kids, and I, I think I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people out there, and we're all busy and is there any is there any advice? Is there you know how do we kind of get inside our kids? Are you worried for this generation or? Yeah, I mean, I've I've got a twenty two year old, and um, and and I spend a lot of time around young people as well, and I am and I'm not. Um, you know, I think in some ways, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, worried for them just because. The world has changed uh, and it's changed, you know, while they've been growing up and it's changing very rapidly. Um, but at the same time, you know, 
they have lived through the change and some of it they're they're just sort of you know coming into adulthood after it's already changed so they have an advantage over us who have seen you know the old world and now we're concerned and we're trying to catch up and trying to figure out this new world where they've already figured it out because they grew up in it and you know um so so on the one hand i think that there's some advantages but i would say that life is still life and there's still some fundamentals with life and i think that you know my worry for this generation is that um while things have changed dramatically um you know and 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 this generation and sort of you know that before them have you know sort of ushered in this change um the world is still you know the the it's it's still the same world um and there's some fundamentals around that that i think that they sometimes believe that those no longer apply and it's going to be a rude awakening for them that to find that while the world is is changed dramatically from you know what their parents you know what we sort of you know went through um there's still some fundamentals the world is, is it hasn't it's, 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 it hasn't changed to that degree um so you know i i often use the 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 example you know you know social media people get lost in it and now you've got you know you know the metaverse coming at some point and you know and people will sort of get lost in that and you know and, and i can see a situation where you know people are so in in there you know that they it blurs the lines between reality and and um and and virtual um but your stomach isn't virtual it still needs real food <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you know i mean so that's an example of where you know there's a balance and and i, I look and I, i i i'm all about innovation and technology and and a lot of things you know in this world that you know that i grown up and lived through you know need to change and a lot of those things are changing and i'm not one of those people who's afraid of change and not one of those people who because i'm 55 years old i want to see the world just you know stay you know as the world that i'm familiar with i'm 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 open to change i just think that yeah young people all of us you know we need to make sure that we we balance that and understand and be able to keep you know some perspective uh around all of this change and understand that you know change doesn't come without some some pain and consequence as well you know even when it's good change it, it, you know often there's some carnage along the way and and we're we're kind of seeing that now i have fi- final question and uh, if there's anything else you want to add after but uh because it's been great really enjoyed it i've a hundred other questions in my head but again uh, we want to uh, manage your time well as well people who inspired you when you were growing up people who were your heroes and people to this day who you'd still look up to and could be from sport or anywhere uh, across any spectrum yeah you know it's it's changed over the years and it's been it's been people who you know who have inspired me and people who have influenced me really have been people that most people probably wouldn't know you know nobody knows my dad you know but my dad was my hero growing up you know and um you know i didn't watch a lot of tv growing up i was always out on playing um so i didn't have heroes on tv my heroes growing up you know weren't sports people that i wanted to be like it was my dad just simply because my dad was um he always seemed like he was in control of of everything well, and we we didn't was it was it a bit sorry to jump in was it cuz i just watched the movie recently with serena and and venus williams you, you saw that did you see that movie recently and like what he was obviously a very very passionate father for for them and was he that style or was he more laid back than him no my dad was more more what i couldn't certainly couldn't call him laid back but it was different you know my dad was um was you know five kids you know two parents you know we didn't have much um you know but my dad worked really hard to make sure that we had all of the things that we needed uh but we certainly didn't have much of the things that we wanted um uh, and um but but in in you know as a as a as a black family growing up in America in the 70s and you know without much you know it can be very difficult um financially and um but my dad you know and it can have all kinds of problems which we had you know 
because of uh, the finances and, and that sort of thing. But my dad made sure that, you know, he just always seemed to be able to figure out a solution to every problem. He always was able to remain calm and figure it out. And he just always seemed to be in control of, you know, and wasn't afraid of a problem. Um, not because of, you know, sort of a, you know, my dad was the, was not like a Richard Williams, you know, thinking, okay, I, I'm going to, my kids are going to go on to become these amazing. My dad was, you know, very much a, you know, keep your head down, work, get out of this situation, you know, get a really good, get an education, get a really good job, keep it simple. His expectations were, you know, by the average person, you know, and probably most of, you know, the, 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 the people who are going to be at this, at this conference, you know, that's a very low bar. But when you grow up as a black American family in the seventies, you know, and, you know, probably below the poverty line or right at it, that's, that's where you, that's where you have to be focused. And that's hard for a lot of people to understand, but that's where you, you have to be focused on just getting out of here and getting on par because you're already below par. Um, so when you're below par, very few people, you know, um, who succeed, and get to par, get there by aiming to become, you know, the best in the world at something. <laughs> you know, so my dad wasn't thinking, yeah, my son's going to go on and be an Olympian. You know, that's far from, you know, anything that he was ever thinking of. And certainly, though, once I got there, he was very proud. And, and I can point to a lot of things that, uh, that I learned from my dad that, uh, that allowed me to get there. Is he still with us, your dad? No, he is. He's, he's, he's moved on. He had a great life, and um, but um, he passed away three years ago, um, and um, so he got to see my entire career, travel around the world, and you know, with me, and so yeah, he had a, he had a great life. All right, well, th thoughts and prayers with him, uh, Michael. Uh, sincere thank you again for this, and we absolutely can't wait to see you uh, January the twenty fifth and twenty sixth, uh, Dublin, at the convention center. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thanks, Michael.